you cannot have democracy before liberation. You cannot have democracy under, under occupation. You do not wait for the colonizer to accept what you are saying. You force the colonizer. And that is what resistance is all about. Dr. Haidar Eid is a professor of post-colonial and post-modern literature at Al-Aqsa University in Gaza. He received his PhD in English literature and philosophy from the University of Johannesburg. He is one of the intellectual leaders of the global movement for Palestinian liberation. This is my problem with uh, white liberal ideology. It talks about the other, it claims to be recognizing the other in order to assimilate the other. When the other comes up with something that is completely different from what the Western self is defending, the other becomes terrorist, the other becomes unacceptable, even if the other wins legitimate elections. I think we ought to recognize the results of the 2006 elections. Um, and I think Hamas, since it won the elections, in spite of my ideological differences with Hamas, I accept it as the democratically elected government of one third of the Palestinian people. And I'm saying one third because the Palestinian people who were allowed to vote were the Palestinians of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Now, six million Palestinian refugees were not allowed actually to, 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 to vote. Do I support them? No, I don't support them. But I believe that they have the right to form a government because that is the democratic choice of the Palestinian people. But that was not accepted by the United States of America, nor was it accepted by the official Arab regimes and the Palestinian Authority and Israel. We have nothing left of the left in Palestine. Their revolutionary consciousness has been washed out by a process of, I would call it corruption and enjoyization. It's what has been going on since 1993, since the signing of the Oslo Accords, is what Edward Said called peace industry. It is a process that aims at washing out the revolutionary consciousness of those who were involved in the struggle against occupation in the first, during you know, the first Intifada, 70s and 60s. It aims at putting an end to the idea of liberation. And people who are supposed to safeguard the idea of uh, liberation, people who are supposed to be struggling for the return of, of refugees, are supposed to be the left-wing organizations. I mean, it is, you know, promises upon promises upon promises, and then here we are. And our situation is much, much, much worse than, than it was in 1993. But this is not a reflection of our problem in Palestine. This is a reflection of your problem in the West. This is a, a reflection of the contradictions that of late capitalism, let me say. I mean, when you talk about the United States of America, when you talk, it's that kind of postmodern politics that does not take into consideration the perspective of the other. That's why I have a problem with the hypocrisy of white liberals who try to tell us what to do. The problem with the Palestinian leadership, it is in a limbo. It is stuck in, you know, the slogans of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. We need to address the Palestinian issue as an issue of liberation rather than independence. If I, as a victim, believe in the universalism or, or universality of my struggle, I think also solidarity groups should support that. Because, well, at the end of the day, it's a struggle for common humanity. We have lost faith in the international community. We have lost faith in the United Nations. We've lost faith in Security Council, the Quartet, and so on and so forth. And the only way forward for us is to build ties with civil society organizations, people to people's um, solidarity. So I think if the marginalized come together from Spain to India to England, yes, we can, we can, we can. Yes, we can, we can change. <laughs> Yeah, I don't want to repeat the same slogan, you know, of Barack Obama, but unfortunately, <laughs> I ended up saying it.